I'm going to read from the Gospel of Luke, and I'm going to be reading verses 18 to 25, um, a very familiar passage of Scripture, and uh, somehow the most familiar passages are the hardest ones to really pay careful attention, because we read that a hundred times, right? We know the story. What are we going to read that we haven't seen before? Well, we just prayed that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher and would apply His Word to us. Please stand with me, if I may ask you to stand at this time for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read verses 18 to 25. But they all cried out together, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked. But he delivered Jesus over to their will. This is God's Word, inspired without fault. Be seated, please. You ever watch a movie or read a book where, you know, the, the person of focus in the movie or in the book is wrongly accused of something? And every time you see the movie or when you reread that section in that book, You hope that they're going to get it right this time. Come on, finally. Okay. The other day, the other night, I watched The Green Mile. And, uh, you know, it it was interesting. And it's been several years since I watched it. But the great big hulk of a fella, John Coffey, uh, really the focus of the movie, as you, as you watch the movie, you figure out he was wrongly accused of killing two little children, two girls. He was wrongly accused, being black and in that setting, etc. There was no deliberation, there was nothing he could say to exonerate himself. And even his own lawyer was convinced that he had committed the murder. And yet he was a very gentle, caring soul, if you remember anything at all about the movie. And he was holding the girls, only hoping to help them. He did not kill them. That's why he had those two girls in his arms. And how frustrating. And it it made me angry to to watch it and thinking, how could they? But he wasn't even given a chance. And so when I read this passage, I'm getting the same feeling, don't you? That, wait a minute, he didn't deserve to be killed. Okay, looking back, and you know, if you you have your Bibles open, and I hope you do, You'll read back in the section, and uh, chapter 23 begins, Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ a king, and okay. So the leaders, the spiritual leaders, got it wrong. The chief priests, the leaders of the, of the synagogue, they had it wrong. They were making up things, and they knew it was wrong, but they were making up mistakes, sins of Christ. 
Now, why? Well, we can kind of understand that, I think. Everything about Jesus stood against who they were. Everything about him. You know, he had priorities and values that didn't mean much to them. They had it backwards when we read the Sermon on the Mount. It's kind of like, I like picturing it this way, it's kind of like walking into a store and somebody has switched the tags. And things that are really valuable have a low price tag. And vice versa. And that's exactly what Jesus did when he preached that Sermon on the Mount. The things that meant nothing. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For example, do you know what that means? Poor in spirit? There are two words in the Greek language for poor. One is penes, and the other is tokos. Penes. Penes refers to the people who had nothing whatsoever. And there was nothing in the cupboards. And if they didn't get paid at the end of the day, the family did not eat that night, period. That was penes poor. You've heard it, penny poor. Maybe that's where it comes from. But Jesus did not use that word penes. He used instead the word tokos. Blessed are the poor in spirit, tokos. The word tokos means the people who have absolutely nothing to their name. There's nothing in the cupboards, and they're invalids. They can't work. And he says, happy, well off are the people who have nothing and no way to gain anything. Why? What do those people have to learn? Those are the people on the side of the road when Jesus went walking through towns who were begging. <laughs> and so Jesus is speaking to people, people who love the Lord, who are interested in what he has to say. And he goes, happy, well off are you when you find yourselves beggars. And everything you need, you say, oh God, give us what we need. Oh, God, provide for us. Oh, God, protect us. Oh, God, deliver us from what's going on. Happy are the people who realize they have nothing and they're never going to have anything by their personality or their personal strength or experience or setting it. Nothing. People who completely have to depend on God Happy, well off are you when you finally figure out you need the Lord. Well, the chief priests, they didn't like that at all because, first of all, they, they had a position of authority. They were in charge. And they didn't like what Jesus had to say. And so they had a reason for misrepresenting him and trying to have him executed. They got it wrong. What about the people? Well, the people were influenced by the leaders, the chief priests. They were influenced by them, and to the extent that they chimed in, you know, kind of the lemming thing, where, okay, apparently he's a threat, apparently he's somebody, and if we want to be in good standing with our leaders, we really need to go along. They got it wrong. They didn't recognize who Christ was. Who else? Pilate. Pilate got it wrong, and yet he got it right. On several occasions in the passage we've read, he says, this man has done nothing, nothing deserving death. <laughs> and then on two occasions, but I'll have him beaten anyway, just for good measure. You know, just to try to make you guys happy. Because I can see that's what you want. Well, doesn't that make you mad when there's a leader lacking enough spine to do what's right? Boy, that makes me angry. Well, there are several lessons in there, and I, you know, we can't miss them. 
It's easy to get it wrong in a world that has reasons for us getting it wrong. There's a lot of pressure on you and me to go along with some of the ways and the thinking of the world. And if you and I are going to stand for what's right, what's God-honoring, what's true, there's going to be opposition. There is. And for you young people here, I think it's going to be a lot more difficult for you than it ever was for me. I really think so. Because as we're approaching the end time, the dark, the evil, is more obviously dark and evil than it ever was. There are things you are facing that I didn't face until I was much older than you. And yet you and I, we stand together, and, and my prayer for you as a church is that we would really rally together when we come together for worship. Look at each other. Take a few moments. We belong to the Lord. We belong to each other. And we're here to be each other's cheerleaders and encourage each other. Stand for what you know is right. You know, there is a verse of Scripture always prepared for an answer for the hope that is within you, yet with gentleness and respect. Don't forget that part. That was a part that I unwittingly left out when I was a young man and a new believer. I had so much zeal. Oh, I sent my father a tract talking about why being a Roman Catholic he was going to hell, and he needed Jesus. Well, that didn't work real well. I lacked the gentleness and respect, and it took about two good years to finally work past that. Okay? <laughs> so let's not leave out the gentleness and respect. Yes, speak the truth. And so, you know, there's that lesson in here in the wake of chief priests and elders and all kinds of people who are all rah-rah in the wrong direction. You speak the truth and you do what's right. Okay, that lesson's here, but that's not the focus of the passage. Herod. Herod also said, I don't find anything wrong with this man. He's done nothing deserving death. Herod got it right, but again, he lacked spine. So at the end of it all, we wonder, Lord, why did you give us this story? Why is this, and it's true, it's not just a story, why is this in the Bible? I mean, why a sham of a trial? Why even waste the time? Lord, if it was your desire, your will, to have Christ put to death, we'll just go ahead and do it. Why all these details and steps of the accusations and, and the pretense of a, of a trial? Why even bother? And the reason, I think, is clear as we think about it. It's obvious as we read the Scripture that everything they pinned on Jesus had no basis at all. Jesus was without sin. Jesus was completely and perfectly holy. What does that have to do with you? What difference? How does that affect us? Well, I think in several ways. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God. Let's take that a little piece at a time. God made him who knew no sin. Pilate said it at least twice. Herod the same. I find no fault in this man. Nobody could find 
a single fault in the life of Jesus. That needs to be perfectly clear. So then when Jesus was on the cross, when Jesus took upon Himself our sin, He did so being a sinless sacrifice, meaning He was God. Only God is without sin. God sent His own Son, Jesus Christ, to take your sin, to take my sin. All of it. Every, every bit of our sin, Jesus took upon Himself. Okay, my struggle, maybe you're here with me, I think you are. (laughs) Our Sunday school class really brought this to the surface. My struggle is often that, like Martin Luther said, that thought that there's something I need to do to complete my redemption (laughs) sticks to my heart like the clay on my boots. (laughs) you got to love the way Martin Luther would put it. It's, It's one of those nagging thoughts that there's something I need to do. I need to do better. I need to be more diligent. I need to be more sorrowful over my sins. I need to be more intentional in how I spend my time or where I go. Stop. Jesus took all our sin upon Himself and has given to you that next part of that verse from 2 Corinthians 5.21 that we might be the righteousness of God. So that the perfect holiness and righteousness of Jesus Christ is ours. Every bit of it. And so that nagging question of, well, what do I do with sin? How do I, because I know there are things that I say and do that I, I have no business being a part of. What about those things? I was reminded of Thomas Chalmers and uh, one of the Puritans, and they had really cool sermon titles, folks. They, you know, something about being brilliant, but the other is something about having the language of the day. (laughs) The title is this, okay? Man, this was a real good... The Expulsive Power of a Godly Affection. Okay? And as, as Thomas Chalmers develops that sermon... It's like, listen to it, folks. You'll, you'll be blessed by it. What, what can I do to improve my standing with the Lord? Nothing. Focus on who Christ is and what Christ has done for you. And that will give that is the power of the gospel that transforms. And he, and he says, the mere thought of saying, okay, well, I can't do this. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going there. I'm not going to think those thoughts. The mere thought of trying to push all that out, he says, we just don't have the power. We don't have the ability, the mental capacity, the soul capacity. We don't have it. Instead, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter or completer of your faith. The one who started your faith is the same one who's going to finish it. So fix your eyes on Christ. You know, it's kind of a funny thing. Pastors oftentimes will use expressions and and quoting scripture, and it's accurate, that like, okay, where do I look? How do I fix my eyes on Christ? How do I do this thing? Because again, the whole passage we read, you know, every bit of this was a sham. Christ, the point of this passage, why Luke gives it to us is, Jesus Christ was without sin and he died for our sin, not his. Any questions? 
That's the point of the passage we read. Now the consequence or the, or the fallout from that is that we walk in trust focusing on Christ. How do we do that? Well, one way is meditating. Meditating on his word. Refreshing your heart and your memory, your mind, with what God says is true. One of the best places is Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I want you to take a minute. Look yourself in the mirror. It's kind of neat. We've got mirrors in the back here. I've been looking at myself. been preaching to me. But look at yourself in the mirror and recite that passage. Memorize it first. Do. But read Romans 8, verse 1, looking yourself in the mirror. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Folks, preach the gospel, yes. Start with you. Because you need to hear it. So do I. Because, again, the clay that sticks to my boots is that thought of, that nagging thought that there's, yes, Jesus died for sins, but there's some nagging halo or hint of what I need to do. No, there's not. It's all about Christ. So how do we fix our eyes on Jesus? One is to meditate on his word, which means you memorize it first. Because how do you meditate on something that you, that you don't know? How does it go again? And that takes time. That takes some real effort. Meditate on what God says to you. Rehearse the promises of God God made, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 is another great passage. God made him who knew no sin and personalize it, that I may have the righteousness of Christ. Or how about another one? 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Folks, this is the gospel, the riches of the gospel. How many times have I left worship kind of hanging my head in a setting of, oh, what a bum I am. Oh, how I failed. I was the focus. Okay, if you and I are going to continue to focus on who we are and how broken we are, we will never escape that setting, that sense of need. But in, instead, if we will focus on Jesus, Jesus, here's who I am. I've been transformed by your spirit. I've been washed by your blood. I'm your child. You love me. It's kind of funny when uh, I remember on one occasion being Father's Day, uh, our middle son, Matthew, he could have, he was maybe three, maybe four, something like that. And uh, Brenda had the three boys, Paul, Matthew, and Mark. And uh, I was preaching, and right near the end of the sermon, some, for whatever reason, Matthew needed dad. So he ran up to the front, up the steps, wanted me to hold him. So I held him, finished the sermon holding Matthew. And I thought, Lord, there was no doubt in his mind that he belonged in my arms. You know why I tell you that, don't you? Is there any doubt in your heart and mind that you belong in the arms of Jesus? 
the sinless one, the one who did not deserve to be crucified. He was crucified on your behalf so that you would know that yes, you belong. The story is told, and it's, it's, it's a made-up story, but it makes a beautiful point, so forgive me. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the, there's this thief. He dies, he goes to heaven, and he asks, uh, I mean, always ask, well, why do you think you belong up here in heaven? Because a guy on the cross beside me said I, I could come. <laughs> Don't you love that? Why could you and I enter the kingdom of heaven? Because Jesus said you could come. Need any better reason? <laughs> <laughs> 